Okay, welcome everybody and uh, for a new session of uh, International Plastic Surgery Resident Organization Journal Club. And uh, this month is with the uh, Rwanda team and Dr. Charles and Dr. Uh, Francois and Dr. Rianne. Welcome everybody and welcome to Charles. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, we can. Thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to join IPSRG and take part to this monthly journal club. It is a honor for us to talk on this platform. I also take the opportunity to members and a peaceful and prosperous new year. Many of you, I guess, do not know Rwanda. Rwanda is a small country of 26,000 square kilometers in the heart of Africa, between Uganda in the north, Democratic Republic of Congo in the west, Burundi in the south, and Tanzania in the east. In terms of seasons, it's either raining or not raining. Vegetation is green the whole year, and temperatures are nice, ranging from 20 to 27 degrees during the day, the whole year, and going down sometime in some areas up to 12 degrees in the night. Rwanda is also a great place to visit for its wildlife and flora, stunning hills and mountains, and very welcoming people. Plastic surgery is quite new in Rwanda. The picture shows my resident and I, and I in our first academic meeting in my office sometime in February, 2019. The first time there was a plastic surgeon to practice in Rwanda was in 2011. Since then, we had two Rwandan plastic surgeons practicing in Rwanda, Professor Faustin Hirenganya and I and the first cohort of three plastic surgery residents that started the training program early 2019. And we expect them to complete the training end of 2022. Those residents are Dr. Mukagaju Francoise, who will be presenting the article, the role of super microsurgery and arborization capture in improving freestyle propeller flap survival. And the picture she is there in the center. You can't miss her, she's the only lady. Dr. Shaka Ian, who will be presenting the article, Head and Neck Reconstruction with Venus Flap, a case report. He's on the far right of the picture. And Dr. Nezel Gwaiv, who is on the right of Francoise. Professor Nilenga Nyafostan practices at the University Teaching Hospital of Kigali, which is one of the biggest hospitals in Rwanda that is spread in multiple buildings over an, a wide area, as you can see on the left, a, pic, a Google map picture. I myself practice at Rwanda Military Hospital, which is another big hospital in Kigali. Both hospitals are located in Kigali, the capital city of Rwanda. Without wasting too much time, let's let Francoise present the first article of today's journal club. Over to you, Francoise. Thank you so much. Thank you, it's a privilege for me to present uh, in this group. I'm presenting uh, an article on the role of super microsurgery and arborization capture in improving freestyled propeller flap survival. And this paper has been published by Ankur Kajuria and colleagues in uh, 2021 in PRIS Global Open. So this will be my outline. Um, the term propeller flap was first used in 1991 by Iakosuku and colleagues to describe an adipocutaneous flap 
based on the central subcutaneous pedicle with a shape that resembles a propeller. And this flap uh, uh, could be rotated up to 90 degrees. This concept of propeller flaps uh, has later been combined with the concept of uh, perforator-based flap, the latter being uh, a, 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 a flap that has a skeletonized perforating vessel that can be rotated up to 180 degrees. Since then, now uh, propeller flaps have become an appealing option of, for coverage of a large amount of defects because of its main advantages, including a uh, color match, uh, reliable pedicle, minor donor site mobility, multiple donor sites, one stage reconstruction, easy mobility, just to name a few. So the authors of this paper has, have emphasized on the concept of freestyled uh, perforator flaps uh, as being uh, a, a concept that uh, entails localization of skin perforators using a Doppler and then raise the flap by doing a retrograde dissection unto, uh, until a sufficient pedicle length and size or even up to the source vessel to be able to insert the flap. And this concept has subsequently uh, popularized as both pedicot and free flap types. And for the pedicot, we now know three types of uh, perforator flaps being peninsula, islanded, and uh, propeller flaps. The last type, uh, propeller flaps, have a higher than normal incidence of partial flap necrosis. And the rate is even higher when the perforator diameter is less than one millimeter uh, of size. So the aim of uh, this study was to look at the evolution of an, an algorithmic approach to propeller flap harvest and insert based on a learning curve of a single surgeon's practice. The study design was a retrospective case series and the cases were subsequent cases that were then between 2013 and 2017. The authors included 44 patients that were divided into two groups. One group uh, uh, with, uh, where they did 25 conventional propeller flaps and group B where they did uh, 19 propeller flaps based on a surgical algorithm de developed by the author. So when you go to the surgical technique, when performing uh, propeller flaps, the authors uh, have emphasized again on the importance of dissecting the vascular pedicle as far as down to the source vessel to prevent a, a congestion by kinking of the, uh, of the pedicle or even a torsion of the pedicle. But this has limitations, especially when the perforators are less than two millimeter diameter or when perforator, uh, perforators um, arborize in a deeper plane than the conventional uh, sub suprafacial plane. So the authors also in the paper uh, explain the types of uh, perforator arborization. Uh, uh, the conventional type that we all know, the suprafacial uh, uh, plane, but also the, uh, the arborization in the, the fat or even the intramuscular. And they emphasize on the role of uh, taking a, a bit of calf of muscle or adjacent tissues uh, to the pedicle to be able to capture most of uh, the, the veins and uh, this to prevent uh, for venous congestion as one of the cause of flap failure. So this is the algorithm that the authors developed. Uh, they explained how uh, for uh, for all perforator, uh, perforators that had more than two millimeters of diameter, they would do a conventional technique, and that's where they did the 25 flaps. And for the uh, perforators with one to two millimeter of diameter, they did arborization, and if there was any sign of congestion, they would add on a, ves a venous supercharging. And for perforators of less than one millimeter, they did arborization capture uh, and also venous supercharging. So once the flap has been uh, harvested and inset, they would take uh, up to 15 minutes before 
uh, uh, confirming that the, the flap is fine. And if there was any sign of uh, congestion, they were, uh, we all know that normally for perforator flaps, if there is any congestion on the table, you can either do uh, pivot the flap in the opposite direction if the, the, the pivot was done up to 180 degrees, then you can pivot in the opposite direction or replace back the uh, flap into a uh, uh, donor site and delay it for two to three weeks, or even perform a venous charging of a distal vein within the flap to an adjacent subcutaneous yeah. vein. So in this study, the third option was uh, selected in two situations when the perforator uh, diameter was less than one millimeter or even for any flap that would have a venous congestion on the, on the table. But uh, they also reminded us uh, that in this case, the veins are most of the time less than a, one millimeter of diameter and, and hence a super microsurgical skill set is required. So their outcome the, was to check whether the technical modification uh, to mean arborization capture and venous supercharging made a significant difference in terms of uh, overall flap survival. And the data were analyzed using a two-way ANOVA. So the results, um, the, as we said, they did 44 flaps. Uh, group A, 25 flaps, conventional uh, uh, perforator profile flaps, and then 10 flaps where they did either arborization or arborization plus venous supercharging. The mean age was 60 years in group A versus 50 years in group B. Uh, the patients had no much uh, comorbidities, just few in three patients in group A uh, versus two patients in group B. The mean perforator diameter was 1.2 in group A versus 1.1 uh, millimeter in group B. The mean defect size was uh, 164 square centimeters in group A, whereas it was uh, 241 square centimeters in group B. The mean angle of rotation was 118 degrees in group A, and in group B, the rotation was 154. So the overall survival rate in group A conventional flaps was 64%. Whereas in group B, they had a, a, a good uh, survival rate up to 94%. Uh, Only one flap in, in the group of arborization capture had a partial uh, necrosis. Whereas in venous supercharging, all the seven flaps had a complete uh, a total survival rate. So from the analysis, they, uh, the, the, the authors report that there was a significant difference in terms of flap survival, but there was no statistically significant difference in terms of defect size. So um, in the discussion, the authors um, again explained about the flap survival that it depends on the pressure gradient between the blood inflow and outflow but also the intrinsic vascular resistance of the flap. And to widen the pressure gradient, uh, you either have to increase the blood inflow into the flap or increase the venous outflow or even combination of both. But propeller flaps um, also have uh, a tendency to get venous congestion because their veins are small uh, with a thin wall and they tend to kink, and then uh, uh, this is a compromise to venous drainage and hence a uh, venous congestion. So to overcome this, one has to select the largest possible perforator within the flap, or even augment vascular inflow and outflow by taking a cuff of tissue, that's the arborization that the authors describe, or even to have a, a draining port for the outflow, that's the venous uh, supercharging. So venous supercharging is also described already in the literature in other articles. And this is just one example where uh, Vijayan and colleagues uh, um, uh, did a study 
for comparing a supermicrosurgery assisted venous supercharging of uh, angular artery frap for nasal reconstruction. And um, from their results, they, they, they found that uh, when uh, uh, venous supercharging was done, the venous condition was only a 66% versus 11% in the conventional uh, propera perforator fraps. And there, are, there have also been published other, um, other papers, uh, case reports, where they emphasize on the role of uh, venous supercharging. So this is uh, a good uh, paper. We've uh, chosen, chosen it because it describes a good technique that um, uh, improves the, the outcome for the perforator flaps. And, uh, but we think that uh, the limitation are just a, a small sample, sample size, but also being retrospective, we cannot uh, exclude some data that are missing. So as a conclusion, perforator flaps have become now a popular and useful way of reconstruction because of the main advantages that are described, but also it has been associated with a high rate of a flap, partial or even total necrosis, especially in, in, in the novice hands. And we think that this uh, approach uh, to prepare a flap dissection can improve the results uh, um, of um, preventing the venous congestion of the flap and then prevent the complication of uh, total or partial failure. However, there is a need of a randomized prospective trial with a bigger sample size to be able to measure uh, the, the outcome between uh, arborization capture versus venous supercharging. So these were my references. I thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, Francoise, for an excellent presentation. For me, what I think are strengths of the study, this is a very interesting paper as it gives informative and clear guidelines on improving the survival of propeller flaps, which are a very useful tool in the reconstruction of defect. The technique of recruiting arborization of the perforator complex in the dissection of the flap makes sense. It's all about improving mainly the outflow of the blood from the flap. And every bit of vessel, whatever the size, should be preserved as long as it does not compromise the adequate inset of the flap into the recipient bed. It also reminds us that we should preserve every vein we meet during raising the flap as a potential candidate for supercharging. The few limitations, since case studies, since case studies are not that many, only 44. I would have liked the author to provide us with the full list of the case of the cases, like he did for the seven Venus supercharged cases. This would have allowed us to better compare cases between different groups. The techniques described require high expertise and equipment that are not always available everywhere, but all plastic surgery units should strive to get there. As a retrospective study, patients in a group A seems to have been recruited from the bottom of the author's learning curve. And we don't know how much this has impacted in the results provided. A randomized prospective study today by the same author may give different results. That's all for me. I would like to invite the audience for more comments and questions. Many, many of you are muted.
if anyone wants to speak, we can open the mic for him. Okay, Dr. Zaya advising that we can wait for the next presentation and then we comment on all together. All right. So let's invite Dr. Ian to present his article. Ian, over to you. Thank you, I'm still sharing. Uh, good evening all. My name is Ian, I'm, I'm a resident in plastic surgery and Dr. Charles is, is my supervisor. And I'm going to, to, to present a case report of head and neck reconstruction with a venous flap. A brief introduction, head and neck is the commonest site for skin cancers, mainly the basal cell carcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma. And this is mainly due to the high risk associated with, with, uh, with light exposure and ultraviolet radiation. And these, these cancers after excision, they pose a challenge bo both aesthetically and as, and as well as functional. Uh, reconstruction with local flaps in the face is, is quite limited. It's limited because, especially when the defects involve the three D, the three dimensional facial structures, such as the nose, the eyes, the, the, the lips, and uh, and this has led to most surgeons being conservative and not doing a, a radical oncological excisions in in the face, and hence the in, the, the high rate of incomplete excision reported in the face area, which is 5.8 to 15.9% of incomplete excisions in the face and for non-melanomous facial skin cancers. And this is the highest compared to elsewhere in the, in the body. Skin graft are also not, not ideal for reconstruction of these defects, mainly due to their complications of later contracturing hyperpigmentation, and they also don't give a good contour compared to, to, to flaps. So reconstruction of, of facial, of facial of head and neck defects, especially the face, would depend on, on certain factors such as the size of the defect, the relation of that defect to the aesthetic units of the face, availability of, of the local soft tissues, as well as the expertise available in the facility. And this can, these defects can, they can be closed, they can be led to heal on their own and, or even up to use of free flaps depending on, on the above factors mentioned. So venous flaps, these are non-physiological flaps where, where the venous system replaces the vesicular circuit that is found in conventional flaps. So the venous system serves both as, as the inflow as well as the outflow vessels. And this concept was, was first documented by Nakaima and colleagues in 1981 and was mainly used for reconstruction of soft tissue defects of, of the hand, of the adult hands. But then uh, the adoption, adoption of this, these flap, venous flaps was slow due to the complications associated with them, especially the flap necrosis secondary to congestion. In 2001, uh, Dr. Wu and colleagues demonstrated the use of pre-expanded arterialized venous free flaps for, for reconstruction of, of cervical facial defects after excision of post-burn contractures. And it demonstrated the use of these venous flaps in three cases that were successful. And in 2011, uh, uh, Park, Park and colleagues demonstrated a case series of eight cases where he, he, he was able to reconstruct facial defects after cancer excisions in, in, in eight patients. But these were small defects and the largest being 20 square centimeter. And in the eight cases, six were successful. One, one was, was total flap necrosis and the other was partial flap necrosis. So our case report, it's a case of a 70 square centimeter arterialized venous free flap to reconstruct a complex forehead defect. 
after the Sosio Casinoma reconstruction. And this is the largest venous free flap, none expanded to be used on the face that has been reported. And it's also the first report of the successful use of uh, virotomies in uh, arterialized venous flap. And it was first published in the PRS journal in September, on September 2021 by Dr. Ali and colleagues. And the authors declare no financial interest in relation to any contents of the article. So the case summary, it was a 71-year-old man who, are, who underwent an excision for basal cell carcinoma of the forehead. He underwent three successive excisions due to positive margins, but after the third excision, the margins were negative and reconstruction with and reconstruction with, with an arterialized venous flap from, from the left non-dominant hand was planned. There was no image provided for, for display here after the excision, but we will see during the flap insert. So the flap design, after identifying the left non-dominant hand to use, dominant upper limb to use, a tourniquet was applied on the left arm to, to enable the dilatation of these vessels of the left forearm using a vein finder. The subcutaneous veins were, were located and the, the, the most prominent two, two parallel veins were identified to use as the inflow as the, and as well as the outflow. And the vein on the, on the, on the radio aspect was, was to be used as, as, as the inflow in retrograde as well as the one on the outer side was to be used as outflow in anti-grade. So after, after identifying the two veins that will be the center of the flap and mapping of, this, of, the, skin, of the skin part that will be taken with the flap, a superficial dissection was done and the flap was raised on the two veins that were identified with preservation of the proximal portions of those veins, especially it's about three centimeter from the proximal end of the, of the flap. And any, 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 any interconnecting veins between the two in the inflow and the outflow were identified and ligated to avoid any shunting. So after raising the flap and after clearing of the recipient bed, the, 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 the pedicle, the recipient pedicles were identified and this was the superficial temporal artery for the inflow as, as well as the superficial vein for the outflow anastomosis. After anastomosing the inflow vein onto the, onto, onto the superficial, su superficial temporal artery, that was, the perfusion was not good, it, it was compromised and hence the author thought it was due to, to many valves in series and the valvotomy was done, excising three valves and this achieved adequate perfusion of the flap. After doing the valvotomy, a single dose of, of 5,000 units of intravenous heparin was given. And then <laughs> they proceeded with the anastomosing the outflow of A to to the superficial temporal vein. This was short, the pedicle of the outflow vein was short and the vein graft was needed from, from the left forearm to, to bridge the gap to the recipient vein. After the, that, the flap was well perfusing and the flap was closed with a nylon 5 or suture and the split thickness graft was, was applied on, onto the flap donor site and the, patient, and the perioperative events were not remarkable. The patient was discharged the next day on 325 milligrams oral aspirin for 30 days. And this is a patient at, at, at three months post-operative and he portrayed an excellent contour as well as caramage. So recommendation, recommendations from, by the authors that were not, were not documented before in the previous three cases documented. They recommended the use of shunt restriction by ligating or connecting veins between the inflow and the outflow veins. And also the, 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 the use 
of vavilotomies for large flaps when there is only signs of perfusion compromise. And when this vavilotomy is done, intravenous heparin bolus should be given followed by therapeutic heparin protocol. This was because another case was done like this, where he gave only one, one dose of heparin and there was immediate thrombosis post-operative. So he, he, he shifted to giving a, a therapeutic heparin protocol during the procedure. So advantages of, this, of these venous flaps, they're easy. To, they are easy and quick to harvest, and there's there's donor, donor site morbidity is incredibly low because this is the superficial dissection. There is no there is no extension to the intermuscular septum to identify arterial perforator uh, arterial pedicles, and the flaps are thin and and hair free, especially when they are harvested from the vor aspect of the of the forearm, and this gives a good a good contouring and color match when it comes to facial reconstruction. But then on the downside, especially in the early phases of these flaps, they tend to show early, early, early phase disc discoloration and bruising despite otherwise being perfused. And this is a physiological bruising due to the high pressure faced by these veins that was, they were not acclimatized to. And then these flaps take up to five, up to 10 minutes to reperfuse well even after adequate anastomosis, so they need to be rewarmed and one has to wait for about 10 minutes to see if they are, if they are perfusing adequately. And some veins can be small and short, like we saw in the previous, they had to do a vein graft. It can be small and short for a micro anastomosis at, at the recipient site. So the conclusion from, from the case report was the venous flaps are, being, are underutilized, are an underutilized technique in microsurgical reconstruction, especially in, when it comes to head and neck. And recent developments in venous flap designs, by these, they talk about, they're, to, they're talking about the shunt restrictions and the vavulotomies. They, they've advanced their dependability compar uh, comparable to the conventional free flap counterparts. But this is without to say that these are only three cases that have been reported, and it's not sufficient evidence to to compare with the with the conversion of flaps. And those are my articles references. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Jan, for your excellent talk. I don't have much experience with venous flaps, but the thing that I felt uncomfortable with this case report, and I'm happy to be wrong, was that the author seems to have done this flap as an experiment, considering that he does not give a strong case as to why he didn't choose a classic radio or anaphor poem flap which would have given pretty much the same donor site morbidity, morbidity, morbidity. And also considering that no flap of this size had been done before, plus all the expected complications that a conventional radio forum flap would not have. But again, a long history of plastic, plastic surgery Plastic surgeons have been characterized by innovation. And yes, sometimes we have to take calculated risks if we think that they will be beneficial. So at the end of the day, it's rather mixed feeling instead of uncomfortable feeling. On this note, I would like to invite the audience to give us comments on both articles and interact with us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. This is Dr. Ziaul Islam. Uh, thank you very much for the presentations. Uh, both the presentations were in depth about the article that was published. And I am very happy that this issue of uh, propeller flaps and the other issue of venous flaps has been raised and I am myself also very keen to see 
uh, how many people around the world are doing these flaps, considering, as you just said, that there are much safer options available. Are there people still experimenting with these flaps? I, I'm very eager to learn myself. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Charlie and Dr. Ian and Dr. Uh, Francois. Um, I'll give my impression. Actually, I think the uh, uh, authors of the both uh, articles they were very challenging themselves. Actually, for the selection of the flap, for the technique, for the even for the selection of the patient. Uh, for the first uh, article about the uh, micro uh, super microsurgery. I think the author he was challenging himself wanted to do um, super my so uh, the the aim of the uh, propeller flap from my point of view was the advantage that you avoid any anastomosis you are making it a, a flap perforator flap and avoiding the uh, micro surgical anastomosis so after that the author he is pushing himself back again to do a super microsurgery on a vein. Um, and actually, I don't know what is the size of the vein. If the perforator and the uh, accompanying veins are very small, so how much should be very smaller the uh, draining veins that he will select to supercharging the flap? So I think the author he was challenging himself. Of course, innovation in plastic surgery uh, is uh, required, especially sometimes you, this is the only option you have. But in the presence of other options, as Dr. Zaya said and Dr. Charles, I think it's, uh, it's a very challenging. Um, for the other uh, paper, for the other article about uh, uh, venous flap, a free venous flap, also I think the author who was very, very challenging himself actually, because the selection of the patient is old age and they have comorbidities and how long does the uh, surgery will take in presence of other options, more simpler options actually, and uh, to add more and more steps that uh, uh, endangering the flab like uh, valvotomies and, uh, and so on in addition. I think it's uh, very challenging. Uh, and as you all said, uh, in presence of other simpler techniques, I think it's, uh, it's difficult to choose such uh, technique. But however, as you said, uh, innovation of plastic surgery is required, especially if you don't have any other. Does. I think it's as a salvage boat uh, whenever you have, don't have uh, other option. Thank you. Hi, how are you? I'm Dr. Good. Hi. So, uh, owner, so uh, I would like to, first of all, Sorry, uh, I have something uh, urgent, so it's, that's why I go outside. But I, um, I uh, attend all the, uh, the journal club. First of all, I would like to uh, thank a lot for their uh, Francois and uh, his boss, <laughs> Dr. Charles and Dr. Ayan, um, for this nice uh, National Journal Club uh, event today. And uh, I'm really happy uh, to be with us. Uh, uh, also, Professor uh, Z and Professor uh, uh, Salah make comments about the, the content. For me, I'm happy for all <laughs> by you. And thanks for all the audience also. Thanks. Hello, Ala. It's always good to see you. Yes. Uh, my main problem with the propeller flap is uh, that there is a high likelihood of it failing. And when it fails, the resultant defect is two to three times bigger than the actual defect that was there to start with. There's a question about valvotomy. Maybe asking how, how is valvotomy is done? The authors have mentioned they did it through a valvotome, but they did not explain how they did it. 
He's uh, just explained it in short. He explained in short. I read the paper. He explained very briefly. He said that it make it retrograde. I think it's like a small catheter or something like that to sharp uh, edges. He's passing retrogrades in he in um, uh, the same direction of the valve. Then he pushing it back on the opposite side. So when he's pushing it back, pulling it back, it will cut the valves. But actually, this make intimal injury in presence of uh, uh, presence of uh, free flab it's liable for congestion and uh, will be thrombosed again it increases the risk but he is injecting a bolus of uh, heparin and uh, my concern about the venous flap to be arterialized actually is it changing the physiology actually it changes uh, ch it replacing the vein for the artery venous uh, system for the arterial system this will make the, the flab was congested in the beginning. And actually one of the very big dilemmas of free flab that you uh, decide if, the, if it is venous congestion or thrombosis or of the vein. Or, so in the beginning, it will be very difficult to decide the flab. And this is adding much more difficulty and more higher step for the learning curve. Um, to not be easy to decide if this flab is congested only because of the early phase or it is thrombosed so I don't I don't know how frequently you, you take the patient back to the theater if the flap becoming congested and you don't know if this is regular congestion or it is thrombosis. Yes, let let me start with the valvulotomy. I I've never seen it. I've never done it, but uh, I did some search about it to understand the the concept. You need to think about it as a thrombectomy, where you push your, your, your device with the balloon, pass through the, 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 the thrombus, and inflate the balloon and pull the device to bring the thrombus with it. So instead of the balloon, the thrombectomy has parts that it's sharp, on the back and when you are pulling it back, it cut through the valves and that is the principle. And by cutting through the valves, I would also guess that it doesn't cut only the valves but it will also injure, injure the intima. So that's, that's one of the thing that uh, um, I'm not comfortable with, and I don't think that in my practice, I would be keen to, to do it. Any other questions from the audience? Or is any other comment? I would like to thank Dr. Charles, Dr. Francois, and Dr. Ian for this uh, nice presentation and uh, meeting. And uh, as Dr. Charles said, Rwanda is in the heart of uh, Africa, and uh, now it's in the heart of uh, International Plastic Surgery Resident Organization by accepting the, our invitation to present this uh, meeting today. And I uh, would like to see you in the future for other meeting, inshallah, and other activity. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Hala. Thank you, Dr. Zay, and thank you, all the audience. And see you in the next uh, month, inshallah. Thank you for all. Thank you, Abby. Thank it's you. Not, it will be not the first, first time you will be with us next activity, Dr. Charles. You have, sure. you have a great, yes, you have a great uh, lady, Francois. We are, is with we are us. here to stay. We are huh? here to stay. We are yes. here to stay. Yes, sure. she's nice. Sure, sure. Okay, okay. So, see you in January. Thank you yes, very much. Happy you. New yes, Year, everyone. Happy, Happy New, New Year. Year. Happy New Year, Zia. And all of you, Professor Salah, all of you. And Merry Christmas for the other people. And inshallah, Sana Saida. New Year's full of uh, successful money, love, what else? <laughs> <laughs>
house, <laughs> gold. <laughs> what you need, <laughs> we will add it. <laughs> a lot of cases, also a lot of cases for uh, Ian and Francois. <laughs> Definitely. Yes. We didn't uh, see uh, uh, Ian, he didn't see anything. Bye or something. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. Thank yes, you. He's really shy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Bye. Okay, bye. Okay, bye. bye.